In this section we're going to look at running between the wickets. The key thing from a strength and conditioning perspective is that you make sure that everything that you do with a player is relevant to him as a cricketer. Having said that, in this part of the game you have to marry developing athletic ability and specifically speed with the cricket element and the decision making element. One without the other will end up in disaster outside in the middle. Take a single, they'll have to hurry. Laurel's return hits the stamps. He's gone. A 0.25 a second is about a yard in timing off the television. So the fact that if you're a yard out, a yard in can change a game and that often is gauged around your turn speed, how you hold a bat when you run the wicket. So the little things can make quite a big difference. We're just going to look at Michael, who's going to run through, showing us an efficient bat position in his hand. The key focus here is when he starts running, look at the position of the bat and how he's holding the bat. He's cradling it so that he can get as close to a sprinter's running action. If this hand comes too far down um, the handle, when he comes to run the bat in, he's going to lose the length of a handle which obviously could be the difference between being run out or staying in. Now you see that Michael moves naturally very well, he's relaxed. If you look at his legs and his feet as he accelerates away, what you'll notice is that his initial strides are fairly short and choppy. This is very similar to a sprinter exploding out of the blocks. This is where we link the cricketer to the athlete. Look also at the position of his head, which shows that he's trying to stay low, which enables him to accelerate. You will see after about 10-15 metres, his head starts to lift up. That's as he's starting to get up to maximum speed, rather like a sprinter in a 100 metre race will explode out of the blocks and gradually drift up. That's all well and good, but as you can see, it's slightly unlike a cricket situation. He's ready to go, so he's almost like a sprinter. So what I'm going to ask Michael to do now is play an imaginary drive and then try and get his bat into an efficient position and then show us the acceleration again. Well, there's just little facets of the game that everybody can improve. You're running between the wickets. It's all little areas that we can improve and we haven't played good one-day cricket, so it's areas that we definitely need to sort ourselves out in and try and get ahead of the game in them. What other things are key components for you to run quickly? Keeping my head as still as I can, staying relaxed, don't tense up. You just move more efficiently when you're relaxed. If your movements come a lot smoother, every fraction of a second will make a difference. What's a situation where it's very difficult as a batter to try and stay relaxed? Obviously in the height of the game, when you need so many runs off little overs, you've got a lot of other things you're thinking about, but if you can just keep it in the back of your mind when you're running, it could make the difference between when you're coming back for that second, and you just get in, the difference between being in and out and in. So. Do you find when you work that quick single, do you find that can be quite hard to stay relaxed because obviously there might be a direct hit. What do you try and do to stay relaxed when you work that quick single? Just keep your focus really on where you're going. Make sure you go as straight as you can. Don't zigzag down the wicket. Keep your head still and wait going in the right direction. Hopefully if you've played a shot, you'll anticipate the run there and so will the other guy. So you'll hopefully get in. If your head's still, you'll be in a balanced position. Much like your batting, the stiller you are, the more balanced you'll be and when you're balanced, can run quicker and you can hit shots better when you're batting. Same yeah. in batting, really. I believe that two types of turn are the most effective and efficient. One of them is almost what I would call a sprinter's turn, where you're almost jumping in the air to turn your body so that you are able to go from one direction into the other as quickly as possible. As I come into the line, I turn, get my feet almost aligned to go back in the other direction, and I explode out. A lot of other elite players do what I would call the half and half turn, which is as they come in to ground their bat, they get into almost exactly the same position, but this foot isn't completely round, it's slightly turned. Some guys like the feeling of sliding in low and driving out of this position. It also means it makes it easier to look at what's going on in that part of the field than if you're blocked off, perhaps being more comfortable looking at the other angles when you're making your decision making. What is a bad turn? is if a player comes into the turn and they're too upright, therefore they haven't decelerated, and they end up just walking in and leaning in. Because all of a sudden, I've broken all of their momentum, I'm in a high body position, and to come out from that is very slow. So now we're going to look at the deceleration component. What I'd like you to look at is Michael's body position after his initial acceleration as he prepares for the turn. He stays low in the acceleration phase, but as he gets halfway down the wicket, He's already thinking about transferring his momentum and his speed back for the two. So watch as his body gets lower and particularly at his feet as he prepares to decelerate under control and then put the turn into practice. It's quite a high level skill that needs drilling and practicing. 
Clearly things change when we work the ball to another part of the field. And you might want to look to turn the other way. On a cricket pitch you'll have a five foot marker. We've marked that with a green cone there. The cone's there because you should be looking to turn before you get there, making sure you're as low as you can, and then really exploding out from the crease. It's just a guideline for the batsman to know when you should be very ready to do your turn. You've got to clearly maximise the first 12 yards as acceleration, and then you're going to try and maintain that speed and then start decelerating, but without losing too much speed. So you want to leave it quite late so that you can then transfer the energy back in the other direction and then you're going into another acceleration phase. I would imagine as well, when you're looking in the modern game to push teams as much as you possibly can in the field, by running the first one really quickly and nailing the turn, you've got more chance of turning a one into a two, a two into a three. And in first class cricket, elite level cricket, international cricket, five, ten runs in an innings is the difference between winning and losing. It's an area, you know, certainly in this series with India, we know that we're the younger of the size, probably a bit fitter, I would have thought, and it's an area that we can steal maybe 10, 12 runs in the game. What I'd like to do now, just so we can have a look, can you show us a run three so that we can look at the acceleration phase into a deceleration and a turn and then the process repeated as we run a three. Perhaps on the third one you might have taken a moment to look up pause because on the three it's always are we going to get there, are we not going to get there. But then obviously when you pause it's very important that if you've taken a bit of time you've got to make sure that all your acceleration is fantastic so that you do get in. To be able to get into the acceleration and deceleration and turning positions, for example I've just seen you on your turn, your other hand touches the floor which is how low you get, they're very explosive positions. In the winter what would you do to try and get into shape to be able to execute that in the summer? You'd be doing some overload training with some cables behind you to sort of give you a force to pull against and when you take that away you'll be quicker at it. Practicing your turning, great exercise to do. The key is just being getting as low as you can really, the lower you are the quicker you're going to turn. If you can put pressure on outfielders and, and nipping twos when you've obviously only hit the ball once, you nip and runs easily. It puts massive pressure on the opposition and I think certainly turning is a key thing and getting the techniques right and turning because that is the key fears of running between the wickets. It's how quickly you can get in and out of that crease and that can save you valuable time. I've marked out some cones. Michael's just going to work at short distances, starting off with the yellow cone, working to the first green cone, just working on a short distance, developing his turning. I would do this kind of work with a seven, eight year old player. It can be fun, you can make it a competition, you can have lots of cones lined up in a row, but the important thing is if you do make it a competition that you make sure that you want high standards, you want the players to be turning efficiently. What you will notice is that his hand is on the floor and if you're looking for a comparison with Olympic sprinting obviously it's effectively a three-point start the turn. So now we're ready to work to the next progression is, is we've got the bat involved and we've got him wearing gloves. He's going to go over the same distance but what we're going to do is we're going to adjust the drill a little bit for a couple of reasons. One to increase the speed to make it more difficult for him and to make it more of an advanced skill and closer to the real thing. And two, we may incorporate turning on a sixpence in a short distance, doing one turn and then another turn, which also has a conditioning and a technical overload element as well. So what I want you to do now is we're going to go to doing two turns. So you're going to do a turn at the far cone, which is about seven or eight metres away, and then come back and turn. And I want you to do two turns at each end. Now we're going to take it over the full distance. We're going to get him travelling in from 22 yards. I've got him fully padded up with his helmet on. And I'm also going to hold this pole at a low level to encourage him to get low underneath the turn. So you just want to hold it at a steady height and you may lower it as the player gets more confident. The key issue with players wearing pads, and you'll see this with youngsters particularly, they'll do all the technical stuff running between the wickets absolutely perfectly and then suddenly you'll put a pair of pads on them and they'll start running with straight legs because it feels funny and unusual. So you need to make sure that they've got the kit on correctly and they're not wearing under 11 pads when they're under 8 because otherwise it's going to totally negate all of the quality work that you're doing. We've got the cones marked out again like we had for the turning so if you could perhaps talk us through what you would do as a non-striker to be ready to support the guy at the other end running between the wickets as quick as possible. Well the rules state that you can leave your crease once the bowler has got into his coil position to when he's bowling. You can look back and as soon as he gets into that position you want to be getting as far down the wicket as you can, especially in one day cricket. Absolutely, and I suppose the only dismissal that you're open to is if the ball gets drilled straight back and he gets a lucky hand on it and it hits the stumps. But you can't completely eliminate that risk. You come out the crease and you want to be ready to sprint as quick as you can. If you're standing up like this and then there's a one, you have to go down and then that adds extra time to your time between the wickets. Yeah. So basically just being 
ready to run or say no as soon as possible. Let's watch Michael running between the wickets from the non-striker's perspective. So you're just going to run a two as the non-striker. I believe it's very likely that if you get things absolutely perfect when you're not under pressure and you drill them and then you take it into drills that are much more live and realistic to the game, you're going to be successful when you go out in the middle. I still find it extraordinary how people don't know how long it takes them to run a, a two, for example, or run a three. If you ask a baseballer how long it takes them to run the first base, you will know to the um, nearest decimal point, I guess. And, uh, and that's something that I think should probably come into cricket. The key thing with all of this is that it's all well and good having theories on what is good technique or what isn't good technique, but it has to be backed up by empirical data and statistics which say, if you do it this way, you're going to achieve this level of performance increment. Obviously, individuals are different, and some people are naturally very, very quick between the wickets. Some people are naturally very good at getting technically into a good turning position. In my experience, working with Sussex players, working on turning speed, and working on the kind of technical stuff you've seen in the section today can take two to three tenths of a second off their run three time and can take one to two tenths of a second off their run one time. To put that into context, that's two to three tenths is almost three quarters of a pitch length. That's a huge distance when you're talking about run outs and the premium that's put on getting runs under pressure with fielding sides getting more and more advanced. At Sussex, we pride ourselves on the strides that we're making in one day cricket. We've put a lot of emphasis on trying to